Hey. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for being here and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this very nice place. This has been my first time here and in the US actually. So it was about time. <laughs> Um, so this talk is about out of equilibrium dynamics of integral models. So everyone here, I think, knows about integrability. So, so that would be familiar. And actually, we just heard from Ben Sang about out of equilibrium dynamics in a quite different type of model, a kind of simplified version in some sense of what I will say now. In fact, I think if I had known what he was to going to talk about, we could have had our talks in the opposite order, because I'm going to say actually something more about GG and GHD and things like that. So he would have saved himself the effort to try and define everything. So what I tried to do in this work with my collaborators was to take the ideas of generalized hydrodynamics that Ben Sang already talked, us, uh, talked to us a little bit about just now, and explore those ideas for a very special integrable model, or quite special, which is an integrable model that has the peculiarity of containing unstable particles in the spectrum, which is not something that happens for many theories that are integrable. Um, so uh, just in case uh, after the talk you feel burning interest in this topic and you found it uh, really quite exciting, so I just wanted to show you the papers upon which this work is based. So there are three papers that are published with several uh, collaborators and there is one in preparation at the end, which hopefully will come, up, come out soon. So my talk is gonna be a, a mix and match of a few results from all of those uh, papers. Of course, very summarized, but more details are in there. And these are the nice people I've done all these works with. So just very quickly, Cecilia was my student. She's now a postdoc in Nottingham. Alexandra was a student at Oxford. She did this work with me and now she's a postdoc in Oxford as well. Francesco Rovanini, many of you, here, no, Pasquale Calabrese, I think, too, uh, Benjamin Doyon, and finally David Horvath, who is a postdoc at CISA. So um, different works with different people. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about the structure, what I will tell you. So I'm gonna start by uh, telling you something about the model. So the model I, I will be talking about is an integral, it's a massive integral quantum field theory. So you have some massive spectrum, and it's the simplest, non-trivial member of a very large family of models. In fact, there are infinitely many. Uh, these are called, have been called homogeneous sine Gordon models. They were originally studied by a, a group in the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, the same place, the same place where Ricardo Borsato is now based. Um, and uh, essentially a lot of uh, things about these models were understood by that group in the 90s, including proving their integrability, both classical and quantum, and uh, computing eventually uh, an exact scattering metrics uh, for uh, the models. So these are rel relativistic quantum field theories. So the SU3 level 2 is the simplest of that family. I will show you this metrics a little later. And this model has, uh, well, this special feature of containing two stable particles which can fuse to produce an unstable one. The way they do that is that in the S metrics, there is a parameter, usually called resonance parameter, sigma. And this parameter creates a new energy scale, which dictates when this unstable particle can be formed, depending on the energy that's available. Because of that, uh, one of the special features these models have is that if you, comp if you do their TBA, their standard equilibrium TBA, we heard a lot about that already in this conference, and you look at the scaling function of the TBA, the typical C function, what you see is that it can have a double plateau structure. And so what you see is that, uh, so beta is the inverse temperature. So you see that if the temperatures are too low or quite low, uh, namely there's not enough energy to form this unstable particle, the two stable particles, they actually behave like two free fermions. And so this function flows to the value one, actually, of the central charge. But if you have enough temperature, enough energy, uh, the central charge starts to change and you reach a new ultraviolet fixed point, which has the central charge that actually Chang Ringang mentioned yesterday, six over five, 1.2. So um, uh, if you look at the wider family of these models, in general, you find uh, scaling functions that get more and more complicated with multiple plateaus that you can explain also algebraically, uh, the connected to this uh, algebra here. So, um, so this is the simplest, as I said, a bit more later. I'll tell you about the model. I will then tell you a little bit about GHD. So Vincent already gave us a, a very quick introduction to that. 
So I will tell you about GHD in the context of integral quantum field theory, which is kind of, um, well, uh, the, the continuous version of what he was telling us about. So very similar to what we already heard. And then I will show you, hopefully, uh, a few results. I don't know how far I'll get, but it's not a very long talk, so hopefully I can tell you everything I intended to. So this picture here is representative. Uh, what is represented here is actually the spectral density or the density of states of the TDA. So a function many people have talked about already. And one, uh, so in this model, there are two particles. So there are two such functions at equilibrium, at thermal equilibrium. And what you see here is that um, in many cases, uh, these functions now developed through, uh, they develop three local maxima, which is quite unusual. Very often they have two actually, and, and they tend to be symmetric. Instead, you see that they are mirror reflections of each other. Parity is broken in this model. And you have this, um, well, different maxima that appear. And this can be connected, again, to the presence of this unstable particle, OK? So uh, let's start, then, with this three-part uh, structure. So first of all, the model. I already told you a little bit about it. Um, it's the simplest of this family. Now, this family of homogeneous angular order models, they are also related to Toda theories, like essentially every integral model, one way or another, is related to Toda. So they have uh, an underlying algebraic structure. And uh, so there is a sort of thinking diagram representation that you can have for the TBA, for the models. And for this one, because it's so simple, the structure you have is just essentially two nodes with a link between them. So you can think of this model as having two particles, which I call plus and minus two stable particles, and uh, they interact with each other uh, to create this unstable excitation. So this is when the link is in there. Now, if the unstable particle is very, very massive, so if this sigma is very large, essentially, um, there's never enough energy to form it. So this two is as if you broke this link. These two things don't interact anymore. And what you then have are essentially two copies of the A1 algebra, which essentially is uh, icing, okay? The simplest minimal total associated to a one icing model. So that's what you get central charge equals one. So you have essentially two for pre-fermions. So this is reflected in the S metrics. So the S metrics between particles of the same type is always minus one. They interact as free fermions. The non-trivial bit is when this link is in there. So when they start to interact with each other, so plus and minus interact, you see that it's not the same if it's plus minus or minus plus. So parity is broken in that sense. And the scattering metrics associated with that interaction is this uh, scattering metrics here. So it's non-trivial, and it depends on this sigma. So that's where this parameter enters, this resonance parameter. So this S metrics was proposed together with S matrices for the whole family in that paper in 2000. So what you see is that uh, there is this parameter, and there is, as a consequence, also a pole. The scattering metrics has a pole in the what we call the, the unphysical strip. So it's uh, in the, the, the imaginary part is minus i pi half, and it has a real part. And this sigma, we're, we're going to take it to be a positive real parameter, OK? So this is what we normally interpret as an unstable particle. So if we use the Breitbigner the the description, uh, essentially, this is a particle that has a mass and a life uh, time, which are related to, to that sigma. There is a formula that you can write. Now, when we study GHD, uh, this is very much based, ab 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 based on the TBA approach. So we're going to be writing TBA equations. And for that, we're going to need the logarithmic derivative of this S matrix. So I'm going to write it here. These are the kernels. And of course, for the free part, the kernel is just 0. But for the interacting part, the kernel is a 1 over Cauch function. This is a very typical shape for a kernel from integral QFT. They very, very often are like this. But what is special for this model is that uh, this is shifted by plus or minus sigma, OK? And it's different for, for plus minus and minus plus. So as I was telling you earlier, if sigma is very large, this is as if this unstable particle was infinitely massive, so it can never be formed. And so the, the model decouples into two free fermions. If sigma is relatively large, but not infinite, then the mass of this unstable particle can be approximated by this expression. So it kind of goes with the exponential of sigma half. And this is the reason why this sigma half appears a lot in, in uh, many results I'm going to show you. Things change exactly at sigma half. So that represents a sort of energy scale at which this unstable particle can be formed. Um, this is a picture of this kernel. So you see that uh, it's very peaked somewhere. 
But instead of being picked at around theta zero, which is the, what tends to happen with most integral models, these kernels are, are now picked around sigma or minus sigma. So they are shifted. This has co many consequences when we look at uh, all sorts of functions later on. Essentially, what, you, what we're going to see later, for example, with the spectral densities, because of this structure, you typically find that for, let's say, theta positive, uh, the function is going to look like uh, if it was a free particle, essentially because the kernel is zero in here. Whereas if you look at theta negative, you see something different. You see a, a, a signature of interaction. So this is a consequence of, of this uh, peculiar type of kernel for the theory. Okay, so this is the input. Somehow the information that we're going to put on the T TBA and GHD equations to try and get something. Um, what next? So let's say something about GHD. So Vincent told us a little bit about this. So what is this? This is a hydrodynamic theory. So it's a, I mean, somehow it's a technique that has become very widely used since 20, especially since 2016, where uh, it was proposed. And it's a hydrodynamic description of many body quantum systems. So uh, because it's hydrodynamic, it's based on the usual hydrodynamic principles. So it's based on a concept of uh, fluid cells that plays a prominent role. And the idea is that if you have a quantum system, you can look at it at different scales as usual. And normally what, what, we, what we're gonna be interested in is neither the macro or the micro, but the intermediate scale, the mesoscopic scale. At that scale, we can think of this system as being constituted of little pieces, fluid cells, which contain enough particles, but not too many, okay? So they contain enough particles so that if we wait long enough, these, each fluid cell is gonna equilibrate to some uh, distribution. Uh, and that distribution, as we have already heard, tends to be for integral models is normally not a Gibbs ensemble, but it's what Ben Sang already told us, it's a generalized Gibbs ensemble. So it contains a sum of all conserved quantities in the model, which for integral models are usually infinitely many. So this is a picture actually from a review by, by Benjamin Doyon. So in conventional hydrodynamics, in each fluid cell, we, in, we would expect that each fluid cell thermalizes to a Gibbs ensemble, and each fluid cell would have typically a different beta, okay? It would be a different one for each. But here, and the input would be, well, conservation laws and uh, the principle of local entropy maximization. But what happens for integrable models, as we already heard, is that we have many conservation laws. So instead of uh, a Gibbs ensemble, we have uh, this GG. So something a little bit more complicated with multiple scales, Lagrange multipliers, and many, many conserved quantities in there. So, um, so combining, uh, if you combine these ideas of hydrodynamics with the description of local excitations by TBA, you get an, a theory that allows you to compute many, many things, uh, as Ben Sang already showed us, so correlation functions, uh, the currents and the densities of these conserved quantities, it is very powerful. And that's why it's, been, uh, it's very widely used. And um, well, the description, some aspects of the theory were presented in, this, in these papers, in these uh, simultaneous papers in 2016. Okay, so essentially the idea of this project I, I cited at the beginning of our project was to, to take this GHD description and to apply it to this model and to see what effect, if any, this unstable particle would have in the results. How would the results be different compared to a more standard quantum field theory? So um, I said that one key ingredient is essentially the TBA description. So let me say a little bit about that before I go into the results. So we need to have some description of the quasi-particle excitations in this uh, GHD. So uh, in integral models, we are very lucky because we have the better answers that provides just that. And if you are doing integral quantum field theory, so you normally use the, uh, the thermodynamic, well, uh, actually in discrete sim systems as well. Um, so we're gonna use thermodynamic better answers, but based on these scattering metrics I just, I just showed you. So um, the thermodynamic better answers for integral QFT was, was uh, formulated by Samologikov, as, as most of you would know. But uh, it can be extended to GGs quite, quite easily, uh, or quite, I mean, intuitively, essentially replacing energy by some of all conservation conserved quantities. And this, uh, this was done in, in these papers here. So uh, let me just show you the equations quickly. Um, so we, you have, we have seen TBA equations in this, in this conference already a few times, so you will be 
quite familiar with that, but perhaps we don't always use the same notations, everybody. So this is how I normally write it for, for integral QFT. So you have a notion of residual energy, you have a convolution in here, so I think I described that. And by the way, this is a equation for single particle theory just for simplicity. In, in my case, I'm gonna have two particles. I will have two, two copies of this. So uh, what do I have here? So I have a convolution. So this is the usual integral that I haven't written explicitly. This would be the kernel of the S matrix, the phi. Uh, L is the usual L function. So for, for fermionic statistics looks like this. So this is a nonlinear integral equation for these pseudo energies. And then what is especially in a GG is that this term here typically will be a sum. Instead of being just beta times the energy, which is what happens for Gibbs ensemble, it is now beta times HI, where this H are the one particle eigenvalues of each conserved quantity labeled by I. So for the energy, this H0 is M cos theta, for the momentum is M sinh theta, uh, for the particle number is just one, and then you have higher spin ones. This is in, in QFT, relativistic QFT. If you take a, this equation and essentially differentiate it with respect to one of these betas, you get this other equation simply by derivative. And uh, this equation is the equation for the dressing. So Ven Sang was already uh, talking about that earlier. He presented uh, some formulas that included this dressing. So this dressing operation is this operation here. It essentially, essentially tells you how some function changes as a consequence of the interaction that is present in the model. So if HI of theta was the one particle eigenvalue of, the, of some conserved quantity, uh, due to the presence of interaction, that gets somehow dressed and is changed into this function here. So this is how the dressing is, is defined. These are as a, the examples I was giving earlier, uh, if you put mass equals one. Um, and another, well, a very important equation of GGE, which, of GHD, and GG, which Ben Sang also presented earlier, just for different function, is this equation here. So in the case of integral quantum field theory, what we found in our 2016 paper is that the normal modes of the hydrodynamics are actually characterized by this function N, which is the, fill, which is the filling fraction or occupation number of the theory. So it's related to this epsilon that you get from solving this equation. So if you solve these TV equations, which you can do numerically quite effectively, you have your zero energies, you plug them in here and you get the N. Uh, here I didn't write an X and T dependence. So sometimes if you're at equilibrium, you won't have that. But in general, if you have a dynamic situation, you might have a dependence on X and T, and then it's a bit more tricky to solve all these equations. Um, so uh, if you have these occupation numbers, uh, you plug them in there and they satisfy this equation. And there is a velocity in there, which we, we call effective velocity, but it's exactly the same velocity Ben Sang was talking about. So the modified velocity as a result of interactions once more. So one way to compute this effective velocity is, well, there are several ways. One is the equation Ben Sang showed. So there's a recursive equation for it, which looks a little bit like the TBA, but there is also a definition you can write in terms of dressing of uh, energy, derivative of energy over derivative of momentum. Okay, so that's another, right to, another way to compute this effective velocity. So, uh, so that's essentially the equations upon everything is based. And then, well, you have to try and solve them for some initial conditions and see what happens in the space and time. This is what I'm going to show you next. So, um, well, one of the most important things that GHD allowed people to do, and the big, one of the reasons why it's been so successful, is that in particular, it provides a way to compute averages of conserve, of the densities of conserved quantities. So there were these infinitely many conserved quantities associated to each of those quantities, there is a density. So this capital Q are integration of some little Q, which is the density of some conserved quantity. And those densities, the, their average uh, can be uh, obtained in terms of the functions I presented earlier. So it's a function of these stress quantities, of this filling fraction, of the energy eigenvalue, and uh, this is something that was kind of known. So this is a generalization of the uh, free energy that you get from TDA essentially, but for higher, uh, for more general conserved quantities. But what was uh, not really known is how to get the corresponding currents, the currents associated to those densities. Um, and, uh, uh, and this was provided by this GHD formulation. And it, you see that the two formulas are very similar. They're actually related by crossing essentially, energy becomes momentum. 
Okay, so one of the successes of these papers was to show this. Um, in, in my talk, actually, I'm not going to present pictures of this because it's a bit too much. I'm going to show some simpler functions than that, but just to give you an idea what you can do with GHD. Um, ben Sang already told us about effective velocity, so that's the velocity at which these particles actually propagate as a consequence of other particles being there and interactions being present. If the theory is free uh, and, and is uh, integrable and relativistic, well, and it's free and relativistic, then just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this effective velocity is simply a tangent of theta, so it's essential a cosh. Okay, so it's a function that is pretty much plus or minus one, okay, if you normalize the maximum velocity to one. Um, so, in my talk, in what follows now, I'm going to focus on very few functions. In fact, so I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, uh, functions, uh, well, of this function, which is the spectral particle density. So this is what uh, you, some people call this the density of occupied states that you typically get from TBA. So this spectral density, you can compute it in terms of the dress energy and this Philip fraction again. And we'll also be looking at sometimes at this effective velocity and we'll look at the particle density. So if you integrate this density of states over the rapidity space, you get the density of particles, okay? So in my model, there were two particle types. So there's gonna be two, two of these densities. Most of the time, I will just give you one of them, but remember, there's always uh, two particles. The functions are related by, by, um, by parity relations. So they are quite similar to each other anyway. Okay. So, um, so these are the things that we want to compute. So now we want to describe the situation. So how do we create some dynamics in this model? So to do that, one way to do it at least is to engineer some out of equilibrium dynamics and out of equilibrium situation. There are different ways of doing that. We can do a quantum quench, which is, uh, means uh, suddenly changing some coupling in the model, or you can do something a little different so we realized after some trial and error that one particularly effective way to explore the properties of these unstable particles is to, do, um, is to consider a situation emerging from this initial condition. So what we're going to do is to, uh, at time zero, we're going to have a system uh, which is uh, at equilibrium, but such that the temperature is a function of the position, it's a function of x. So essentially for each, for each value of x, we have a Gibbs ensemble, essentially described by the usual TBA with a temperature given by this formula, but that temperature varies as a function of X, okay? So, uh, and we're gonna choose it in such a way that the temperature is highest at X equals zero, and then it becomes uh, much smaller asymptotically. In fact, uh, we're gonna consider two situations, either this asymptotic temperature will go to zero completely, or it would be some finite value, but small. The idea is that typically we're going to choose this temperature in the middle to be high enough to form lots of unstable particles, and this temperature here to be low, too low to have these unstable particles. And so this protocol is a protocol where you essentially have a lot of, you have hot matter around X0, lots of it, and then you release that into a cold environment. Now, when you do that, um, you, what you find is that these unstable particles suddenly, they don't have enough energy to exist and they start to decay. And, well, what we found is that you can see signatures of this decay when you look at the sort of functions I just, I just mentioned. So um, we want to see decay and the time evolution. And we're also going to see that there is a difference uh, in that decay, uh, depending on whether or not we have a bath. So we have some kind of ambient uh, temperature that is zero or not. Um, so if you want to solve this problem, actually Ben Sang also mentioned this, there is a mathematical way to solve this uh, GHD, uh, this high dynamic equations, which is the method of characteristics. So one can, one can do that and implement that numerically and solve this by this method. Uh, and this is being actually explained in that paper. But in our work, instead of doing that ourselves, what we, we were a bit, well, I wouldn't say lazy because we still had to do a lot of work, but we decided to employ a numerical algorithm that is already in existence and is uh, available for everybody to, to use. It's called iFluid. And this is an implementation of GHD that was done by Frederick Müller and Schmidt Meyer. So this is a package that is uh, available for everyone that wants to do GHD simulations. So you just take this package and you have to adapt it to your particular model. In essence, you just have to change the, the scattering kernel and then run it again. 
In practice, we had to do a little bit more because, well, the package, the package was not computing exactly the functions we wanted. So, okay, there's always some work to do, but the essential elements are, are in there. So that is a package that is very, very generic. So you can consider almost any out of equilibrium situation you like. Um, um, so it's, it's, very, it's very flexible. Okay, so let me tell you something about what happens in equilibrium so that we understand a little bit better what happens out of it. So suppose that for a moment we had our model uh, at equilibrium. So in a Gibbs ensemble at some temperature, I call TM. So the temperature in, in the middle of that uh, Gaussian I showed you earlier. So if we are at equilibrium at, at temperature TM, this is something we also studied because for even equilibrium is peculiar for this model. And you look at this function rho, so the density of states, okay? So you plot it against, against theta. What you see is that if you did that for free fermion, this is what this function looks like. So it typically has two peaks, and completely symmetric, and so on. And these peaks, you can also, you know exactly what they are centered around. They are centered around minus log beta half, where beta is the inverse temperature. So minus log beta half plus log beta half. Now, if you look at our model, okay, when the temperature is high enough to have unstable particles, what we have instead is this structure. So we have three peaks, typically. One of them is exactly the same as for free fermion, and this is because of the structure of the kernel I told you earlier. So for positive rapidities, everything is as if the theory were, was free. But for negative rapidities, there is interaction and there is a difference. So we have one peak that is much higher. In our world, we call this the interaction peak. And then we have a little bump in here, which is extra and which is new. Now, it turns out, I mean, I don't want to explain that a lot, but it turns out that the, this peak here can be directly attributed to the formation of the unstable particle. The position of the peak also uh, is a very particular place, which is the place, is the value of rapidity for which interaction is maximized, according to the kernel. So when that happens, unstable particles are formed, and this leads to an increased density of states, essentially. In fact, it's possible to show that the area of this peak, which is essentially the density of these particles, is essentially is the same as the extra area of this higher peak in here compared to free fermion. So these two things are related. Essentially, that there is an increase on in the density of particles of type. This is for one type, so that's particle plus. For particle minus, this diagram would be flipped over. They are related by parity. And essentially, um, the extra density of particles of type minus that you would see in its corresponding peak is matched by this extra density of particles of type plus. So these are interacting with each other and forming these bound states, these unstable particles. So you can understand that very nicely, even in the, um, in the free, in the free, in the equilibrium case, it is interesting to look at what happens. Now what happens when we, okay, put things out of equilibrium? So first of all, let's, let's look at this picture now in sort of three dimensions. So this is at time zero for our Gaussian profile of temperature. So our Gaussian profile of temperatures had a temperature that was higher at x zero. So if you were to cut this picture across like this, you would get this profile I just show you, sorry. So you would get a, a profile such as this if you, if you cut this through the middle. Now, if you, if you move away from the middle, temperature is going down. And so that profile is still there. You still have three peaks, essentially, but they, they, they're starting to get a little bit lower, okay? So it's, uh, it's changing a little bit. So it widens a little bit. But essentially, you still have this in higher peak interacting, subsidiary, the little one, and the free peak in there. If you, if you look at uh, the profile for the temperature, for the effective temperature, uh, you have something that is very much like a tang theta, so it's not so different from free theory. Uh, it doesn't look it here because it's a strange way to represent things, but essentially red and blue mean plus one, plus, plus one minus one values. So, uh, so this goes from minus one to one, if you go like this. So you have profile like a tange function, essentially. But you see that around the place where this little peak is present, where, present, where the interaction happens, uh, this uh, transition of the tangent, the tange is kind of like shifted. Okay, so you have a shift. And you also have a range of temperatures in between. So you have like some intermediate plateau in this tange. So one way to think of that is that when, this unstable, when these two particles uh, come close, um, I mean, they, they have uh, most of the time very high velocities, plus or minus one. But when they come close and interact, they get, they get slightly slowed down by this interaction and they form that bound state. And this is reflected on the, on the shape of the effective velocity. 
So this is all still at time zero at equilibrium, but with this Gaussian profile. Now what happens if you make this evolve in time, finally? Um, so this is the picture I just showed you, and that, and now you see what happens as time passes. So as time passes, if you look at, at this uh, spectral density here, which is the most interesting, what you see is that these peaks start to move. So the free fermion and the little peak, they move towards the right with velocity one. The interaction peak has velocity minus one. Um, but uh, I mean, what is maybe most uh, interesting about this picture is that you see that this little peak that was there starts to disintegrate. And um, after a certain time, not very long, it's not there any longer. What there is in there instead is a tail, a tail of slow particles that have been left behind. So, um, so what you have is the, uh, the, the, in the initial state, you have these unstable particles. But uh, as we release these uh, unstable particles, this hot matter into this uh, cold environment, here, here, by the way, the temperature of the bath is, is zero, so there is no, no bath. Uh, they start to decay. They don't have enough energy to, to, to exist. And they start to decay, and they leave a trace of this decay. They leave a tail, OK? You see that tail also if you integrate this function. So when you integrate over theta, you get particle density. Particle density has these uh, two peaks, and one of them also has this, this tail that develops that's attached to it. So this is the first signature of decay that we see, the first signature of something different happening. Uh, nothing much happens to the effective velocity except that, it, except that it, it kind of moves with that peak, so it kind of just shifts. Um, so this is all for the particle uh, type plus. Um, all these functions for plus and minus are related to each other through some sort of parity transformation. So, so um, the pictures are very similar to, for both. Uh, in, this, uh, in this simulation, um, the resonance parameter is 10, and the maximum, um, uh, the maximum temperature, the log, is about 7. So essentially, 7 is higher than sigma half, and that is the situation where you can have unstable particles. Okay, so that's why we chose this, these parameters. So, okay, so this gives us an idea of uh, a visualization of the decay of these particles, okay, which is interesting. What else can we, can we do? Well, one thing that we can do is to look now at a situation where there is a bath, uh, a temperature that is not zero, that's a little bit higher than zero, but it's still quite low. So when you have that situation, in fact, there is a, a difference uh, on the behavior that you observe, there is something new, and the thing that is new is that if you look at the same picture, which is essentially those, those pictures at the top in there. Uh, so here I just uh, look at uh, um, uh, half of the picture, so X positive. Um, you see these three peaks again, they start to move one towards the left that we don't see, the other two towards the right. This little peak starts to decay just as before. But what we see now is that it doesn't decay fully. Somehow some of the density of these particles seems to survive for very long times. And uh, it survives on top of one of these ridges. So these lighter blue areas that I hope you see, this is, uh, this is the density of the bath itself. So this temperature on the bath creates a particle density. And, and these are these two lines that you see in there, kind of two, two little ridges, two little mountains. So on top of that, there is this density of particles that survive and seems to be riding on, on top of that. The, the picture at the bottom, this is the, the same function, but for particle minus. So for particle minus, things are sort of reversed. So what you see here is its interacting peak moving, moving towards the right. Okay, and you see that it's exactly moving at the same speed as this little one there. So there is a surviving density of, of these particles, which we knew corresponded to, uh, um, were represented indirectly a density of unstable excitations. So how do we understand that persistence of this, of this peak in there? Uh, it is a bit puzzling because actually numerically you can look at the velocity of the, of the particles, at the effective velocity of particles inside that bump, and you can see that it's definitely less than one. Okay, so these are the same particles that were forming a tail before because they were slow, so they were staying behind. Now somehow they're still slow, but they're sort of being carried by something at a higher velocity. Um, so what kind of uh, phenomenon is creating what we call this, this persistent peak? Well, uh, the phenomenon somehow, I, I think it's playing in the next slide, this little video. So what seems to be happening is that the, the density, the high density of particles of the other type uh, is interacting with these ones here, a little bit like a magnet. So it's, it's sort of carrying them at its own velocity because, um, okay, there are many more of them. There's a much higher density. 
Uh, these are the particles they have this bath to sort of uh, exist on top of. And these uh, particles of time, time minus, I essentially carry, carry this as, as a magnet will do. So I have, a, I think, a little video in there. I mean, it's a very um, simple thing, but I think it, it gives some intuition. We don't have to see the whole video or the music, sorry. So uh, essentially, if you have, uh, if you have some, some material that is magnetic and you have a magnet and you pass it, uh, along this material, well, you can maybe, you can make it move at the speed of the magnet, okay? Whatever the natural speed of the thing there was. So this is a little bit what these particles minus are doing to this, to this little ball in there, to this little density in there. Now, a consequence of that is that if you have a bus that has some temperature, even if it's very low, there can be a surviving density of unstable particles even very late in time. So you're gonna have a stable density of unstable excitations in the steady state after a very long time. Okay, so these particles will leave a trace um, in the, after the system equilibrate, they will still be there. Okay, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon. Here is a, 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 well, a video of the exact same thing, but in three dimensions, so you can see it a little better. So here you have the situation where there is no bath, temperature is zero, and here's the situation with a bath. And if you, if you look at this, uh, what happens here, uh, I think, I don't know if I want to do it on the computer, let's see. So if you look at these at this videos, you see that in the absence of a bath, everything dies and you have a tail, whereas here, this peak is, is sort of uh, surviving, okay? So you have a, a persisting density here that's riding on top of that little mountain there, which is the bath, okay? Um, okay, so, I mean, once you see that, it's all very interesting and quite fun. There are many studies that you can do. So we did this in, in our papers. We went into a lot of detail about not only uh, the decay of this peak, but how fast it decays, what is the decay rate, things like that you can study. So I will show you just a couple of pictures of that. Um, so um, as you have seen, if there is no bath, this, this peak decays fully. If there is a bath, it doesn't decay fully, but it still decays a little bit at the beginning, and actually exactly the same rate as in here. So this is a feature that you can look at. So you can, oops, you can look at that, at that peak. You can look actually at the integral of that peak in rapidity space, which is the density of those particles. And you can, uh, you can plot that density as a function of x and uh, for different times, okay? So essentially these functions here are all the integrals of a rapidity space of that little peak that we were looking at there in the absence of a bath. So when we integrate uh, that, we have, uh, well, we have a different function for each x and for each uh, value of time. And what you see indeed is that as time passes, the size of that peak is getting smaller, okay? Um, the integral itself has a, another peak. So you can, for example, look at the maximum, the maximum of these peaks here. And if you look at that, you can see with the naked eye, actually, that this decay seems to be exponential. And that seems to be some decay rate that you could compute in there. So this is one thing that we computed in our work. We looked at that decay rate. So if you take the log of the highest of these peaks, of the maximum, uh, you see that, uh, well, this log uh, has a, uh, obviously, log against time. You see that definitely there is exponential decay in time. But also you observe something else, which is that that decay is universal in a certain sense. So uh, you see that actually for the, the slope of this line is always the same, even when the resonant parameter and the temperature at the maximum, the, you remember there was this Gaussian profile, so the temperature at x zero is the scale here, the energy scale, even when the resonance parameter and the uh, temperature uh, are different, you still have uh, the same slope. Okay, now they cannot be different in, uh, in any, uh, I mean, um, they cannot be completely different. They have to be related in some, peculiar, in some particular way. And the way they are related is like this. So as long as this kappa, as long as this parameter kappa has the same value, which is actually the case for all these pictures, if you check, then you get the same decay rate, okay? Now that is not entirely surprising. That is a feature that you observe in this model again and again. I mean, even at equilibrium, you see this sort of scaling. Essentially, what this tells you is that there is only one important energy scaling here, which is the relationship between the energy available in the system and the mass of this unstable particle. And everything is a function of that, essentially. So there is a universal parameter on which this uh, decay rate depends also here. 
And in fact, the height of these functions, you can, you can fit it to a function like this, and you can uh, numerically actually identify this function quite precisely as being just a function of temperature divided by mass of unstable particle squared. So there is a, a universal um, uh, property of the decay rate of that density of unstable particles, okay? So there are other features of this type that you can look at, and, and we did a lot of analysis in, in our second, in our third paper of, of these kinds of properties, just trying to identify some universal behavior of this, of this decay. So um, I, I don't know how I'm doing. Uh, keep going, yes. No, you haven't said anything yet, so I keep going. I actually just have one, well, two more slides, so not very much more. So um, the other thing I wanted to show you is something about entropy. So this is the latest work I have been doing with Pasquale and David. It's something that we haven't published yet. We haven't put on the archive, but it's essentially finished. So I wanted to show you two pictures that emerged from that, from that work. So um, entropy. So that's a quantity that, uh, of course, is very, very much interesting in quantum many body systems also here. So one thing that one can look at uh, also to see the presence of these unstable particles and what they do is, for example, the entropy in the stationary state. So when we do this, this quench, or when we do this, when we create this out of equilibrium situation, we let time pass. After a very long time, our system would have equilibrated, and uh, we can look at its entropy in that, in that state. So let me just give you a very quick introduction to some ideas about entropy that are already known, independently of this model. So, um, uh, so these unstable particles will also leave uh, some impact on the entropy, so um, let me just give you a, a brief introduction to entropy after a quench. So there is some understanding of what happens to the entropy growth as a function of time uh, when you put your system in a situation which is out of equilibrium. And that understanding mainly comes from the work of Calabrese and Cardi and subsequent work, but it can be summarized by, by this picture essentially. So there is an idea which is based upon something called the quasi-particle picture it tells you that if you have a system, a one-dimensional system, and you split it into two parts, so you look at the entanglement between uh, sub subsystem A and subsystem B, you can imagine that on each, along this system, along these uh, two subsystems, there are pairs of quasi-particles that are being emitted and that propagate with opposite momenta. And, and essentially, you can argue that as time passes, uh, more and more of these pairs of quasi-particles are essentially interacting with, uh, L, with uh, well, one of them is interacting with a member of a, another pair that has been emitted from the other region. And essentially counting these crossings is a way to measure how entanglement grows. Now, now using arguments of this type and also analytic, analytic computations, Calabres and Cardi uh, showed that in fact, uh, the entropy of a region of length L as a function of time uh, it's going to have this behavior for long time. So essentially, it's going to grow linearly with time, in fact, up to a certain time, which is less than some characteristic velocity of propagation, these excitations. And then after that, it's going to saturate to some value. And that saturation value depends on the length of the subsystem. Okay, in my picture, there is, I well, my picture, there is no length because I essentially took two semi-infinite subsystems, but you could also have a subsystem A of a certain length L, and then that picture would apply. Now, the coefficients of these two linear behaviors, they depend on the theory, this R and this P, but we can think of this uh, P essentially as being the entropy per unit length in the stationary state, and we can think of this R as being the growth rate of the entropy, okay? And these two quantities, SOL and DSDT, are quantities that you can compute uh, by different methods, which I'm not gonna explain here today, uh, one of them is uh, um, um, quench action formalism that we actually used in this work. Um, in summary, we have computed this function. So we have looked at the entropy per unit length in the stationary state for this particular model and for different quenches, not exactly the one I show you now, but others, similar ones. And also we have looked at the gr uh, growth rate of entropy. And I'm gonna show you pictures of these two functions just to show you what the unstable particle does. Okay, and that's the, the very last thing. So, um, so this is uh, the first picture. So here I'm presenting, well, not as exactly entropy per unit length, but entropy per unit length normalized by maximal entropy per unit length. Okay, so I, I just took the entropy, I mean the SOIL, and divided by its maximum value, just so that 
just to make sure this function is uh, maximum value is of course one after you do that. Okay. And here you have actually many functions on top of each other. And they're on top of each other because they are plotted not against the resonance parameter or the quench parameter. This alpha is something that has to do with the quench, with the energy injected by the quench here. Um, so the out of equilibrium protocol that you use, not so important to describe what it is. But this is plotted against some function of these two variables, okay, some universal scale. And just as before, if you plot against this uh, carefully chosen scale, you see that even when the sigmas and the alphas are different, as long as this scale is the same, all of these curves collapse on top of each other, okay? And uh, the important feature is that uh, as, in uh, as happens with many functions for this model, there are two plateaus for this entropy, okay? And one of them is at one because we normalize by S max, so it had to be. But the other plateau is at a value that eventually we realized is not an arbitrary value, it's actually value 0 0.8333, okay? Now that value is exactly the ratio of the central charges of the two UV points I talked about earlier, okay? So it was one and, and 1.2. If you divide one by 1.2, you get exactly that value, okay? So what we are seeing here is that these two plateaus correspond to the, to the two um, RG regions of the model in a way. In the middle, we have the transition that is due to the unstable particle being formed once more, so the usual pattern. And uh, along these plateaus, uh, the entropy is proportional to central charge. And this is actually a, picture, a feature of, conformal, uh, of the entropy of conformal field theory after a quench, which was also um, shown by Cardi and Calabrese in different work. So this is something that was expected, but we see here for this model, which allows us to explore two different central charges. Okay, so this is what's essentially written there. The other picture is a picture of the growth rate of entropy. So this VSDT, which was the other, the other function that we could get expected to, to measure or of interest from, from what I showed you in the previous slide. So if you look at this um, growth rate of entropy as a function of resonance parameter, so mass of unstable particle, for different, different quench energies, so sorry here we use very diff kind of different kinds of notations, alpha, beta, they don't matter very much. It just means uh, this beta is just a measure of the intensity of the quench. And these two pictures are for two different quenches. Okay, but they both exhibit uh, similar behavior. So we have, again, sort of two plateaus, a little bit like before. But what's interesting is that in between there is a, a local minimum that appears. Okay, now this, uh, this property, uh, and, and this local minimum actually doesn't happen, of course, at an arbitrary place, but it happens essentially at the thre once more at the threshold for the formation of this unstable particle, okay? So when this unstable particle first starts to contribute to this system, there is a depletion on the entropy growth. So entropy growth slows down, and then it picks up again and becomes kind of larger, okay? Now that is a, um, a behavior, not, I mean, not exactly in the same context, but in a similar situation, this is a behavior that, that was observed actually in the work of, uh, of uh, Gabor and other people, several works, and they, they talked about this phenomenon, they, well, they refer to it as a dynamical Gibbs paradox. So essentially this idea that if you have a quantum, if you have a system and you increase the number of degrees of freedom present in the system, so the number of ex types of excitations that are present, you are gonna observe an increase of entropy, but before that you're gonna observe a depletion on the entropy growth rate. Uh, and this is also seen in these papers here for, for the kinds of models and, and situations. So we seem to see a phenomenon that is similar, at least to this dynamical Gibbs paradox, also for our model. So again, uh, well, these unstable particles, they leave a certain mark in there. Okay, so this is uh, all I wanted to say about this work. So just, I'm just gonna conclude. So uh, one observation is that uh, GHD not only is useful to compute quantities out of equilibrium and correlation functions and currents and densities, but it actually can give some new insights into scattering, the decay and the formation of particles. So this is a new, perhaps a new point of view on, on GHD. I find this interesting because when I did my PhD, I also studied this model and that was 20 years ago. I looked at its TBA form factors and things like that. And uh, from that time, my understanding of unstable particles has always been, it's a pole in the S metrics. Essentially, it was pretty abstract. A pole in the S metrics uh, signals the presence of these unstable particles. Now, through this work, it's the first time I see these unstable particles actually dynamically uh, 
having um, decaying, being formed, uh, uh, persisting as a finite density. So when you put the system out of equilibrium, you can really actually see the effect, the effect of these excitations in, in your quantities of interest. And you can do that thanks to DHD. So this is, uh, these insights are interesting for this model. And in this model, we see signatures and formation and decay of these unstable particles in many, many quantities. So there's quite a few. We think, we hope that this would be perhaps universal markers for the formation and decay of particles, even in more general theories. So this is a sort of toy model, but perhaps it gives an idea of what we can expect in more realistic uh, theories where there is decay. Um, some of these signatures are the formation of tails of some functions, additional maxima in the spectral density, additional plateaus in the effective velocities, a local minimum in the entropy growth rate. Um, so quite a few things are particular to the formation of these particles. For generic quenches, there is, we see once more there is a finite density of these particles that survives in the long term. So when we look at the stationary value of the entropy, we still see these two plateaus. So we see, still see the presence of, of these particles in there. So although, although the unstable particles individually have very short lifetimes, so the lifetimes of these particles are proportional to exponential minus sigma half. So when sigma is large, the lifetime of these particles is small. So they are forming and decaying all the time, very fast, but there is a finite density of them that seems to be preserved in time in, uh, for certain quenches. Um, and well, one peculiarity of this is that the decay rate of the density of these particles is, uh, well, it's described by, uh, it's exponential in time and is uh, related to, um, is, uh, well, the decay is exponential and the decay rate is, uh, is a universal function of the ratio of the temperature um, uh, and the mass of the unstable particles. So there is a, a universal formula that you can, that you can find. Um, and that's all I want to tell you. So thanks, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that very interesting talk. I yeah. was curious about the persistence of this unstable particle for long lifetimes. I wondered if it could have anything to do with uh, Pauli blocking that there are fermions in the final state that are occupied, so it can't decay there. Is there any? Um, and can you study this model for both for a bosonic uh, system instead? You know, um, a... I don't know. So this is a, a viewpoint I, I never never thought about. So I mean, um, yeah, it's not how I would think about this. I mean, bosonic model. Well, um, if there was a bosonic model that had unstable particles, it would be interesting to study it. But um, the nature of this model is heavily constrained by the scattering metrics, so there isn't really any playing space in there. We are stuck with what we have. Yeah. And we don't have really very many other examples where we can explore this. So um, is the fermionic nature related? I mean, I don't know. Certainly there are free fermions when these particles decouple, but I mean, I think it's more generally the, the particular form of the scattering metrics of the theory that is uh, dictating everything. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I found your comments about the unstable particle, about the general lessons, what you can learn about, to be very intriguing. So now, now you, I think your discussion is about in the context of the integrable uh, structure, right? So yeah. But but uh, it seems that many of the comments you made could, in principle, exist for more, I mean, the usual hydrodynamics, right? So yes, or, or like without any conserved charges, right? Well, I just guess energy, so, yeah. etc. So, I guess so. It, has anything been done in that direction? I mean, what you say seems to have a far-reaching implications to me. Yeah. So. Um... So I don't know if something has been done, but yeah, I agree with you that, in fact, our hope is that some of these observations, the fact that you have tails, the fact that you yes. have certain particular changes to some important functions, that this would be a, a more general trademark of unstable particles, even in other situations, even mm -hmm. beyond integrability. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be an interesting thing to explore, but I don't know if it has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really Thank don't you. know. Yeah. Yep. Can I, so this uh, SU three, three level two, two. Yeah. yeah, is is uh, one in a is the simplest you said in a family of these yes. these homogeneous and golden models. Yeah. So in in the do you expect to see new features or similar features in in, in the others? other? 
Yes, yeah, so I mean, that's of course uh, always one of the um, further things that one could do. So you can take all the models in the family that have more unstable particles, look and look at what happens if you have several. Perhaps some additional phenomenology could be could be found in there, and that is uh, something we perhaps will look at in the future. But uh, uh, I mean, I don't know. So yeah, when you, in these models, if you if you look at uh, higher values of the three and of the two, essentially you have more and more of these unstable particles mm -hmm. and stable particles. So you have more complicated TBA, everything. You would have uh, many more UV fixed points, so many more of these plateaus. So you would have lots of different choices of parameters you can take where you will see different things. Um, but I mean, I think some of the basic features we, we see here, you would see again, just in a more complicated setup. Uh, but it would be, of course, interesting. It's just that uh, numerically, even this simple model numerically, is actually quite demanding to produce uh, all, these, uh, all these results with so many variables, so yeah. Just to put, give myself some context, do these models have a Lagrangian description, or yes, they... uh, yes. So these models, uh, as I said at the beginning, they, I didn't, I didn't cite properly because I, I didn't want to spend time on that. But so these models were studied by uh, Jose Luis Miramontes and Tim Hollowood and uh, uh, by several students of uh, Luis Miramontes, students of him in the nineties. Um, and uh, yeah, so they start from a Lagrangian description. The Lagrangian description is that there are perturbations, massive perturbations of Besson-Minowitan model. So there is a very uh, explicit construction that you can find in the original papers. So they have, uh, yeah, Besson-Minowitan associated to certain cosset, uh, which is the, so the two is the level. So it's the level of the Besson-Minow presentation is the K and the SU3 will be the algebra. So in general, it's, uh, it's an algebra G over U1 to the rank of the algebra, that kind of cassette. And then you add a perturbation, and that perturbation is where eventually this sigma parameter is hidden, if you wish. Right, and can you just remind me then that, the, so the Westmin and Witten is a theory of Bose or scalar particles, I get bosons. Uh, yeah. So, and how are they, how do the fermions? Um, Hmm, okay. Um, so, hmm, not, not sure about that. I mean, in general, actually, in, in two dimensions, the statistics is not so important. So, you can. So, it's some kind of fermionization or. In there. I mean, usually in our context, the way you, you think, I mean, the way you define or you choose the statistics has to do with the scattering metrics mm -hmm. and with the value of the scattering metrics at zero. Things. So, that's how Samologikov this described it. So, if, if S at zero is minus one, I think, then you think of the model as having fermionic uh, statistics. Okay. Um, but anyway, in two dimensions, uh, I mean, there's kind of some freedom to the choice of statistics. Yeah. If you change the statistics, then the TV equations change a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the, you have the filling fractions will be the bosonic ones or whatever statistics you choose. Yes. Um, but for these models, generally you, you choose fermionic, actually for most integral QFTs, as far as I know. Okay, related to his question, so what is the dimension of relevant operator? Yes, uh, sorry, repeat that. You said that this SU32 mod U1 square. Yes. Should be deformed by some. Is deformed by something, some, yes. Some relevant operator. Do you know the dimension of the relevant operator? Uh, the, the dimension of the perturbing field, so I should know, uh, because I worked a lot on this. <laughs> uh, so for this model, uh, for this model, I think it's three over five. Oh. But I mean, I could check. I will have to go back to my PhD and check that. <laughs> but uh, in my PhD thesis, actually, one nice thing we did was to study the form factors of local fields in this model. And we actually found, I think, form factors for, for, for all the fields. So there's a, a CATS table you can, you can write with all the conformal dimensions of the fields in the underlying CFT. And I think there are 10 different fields. Mm -hmm. And I seem to remember the perturbing field, so the, the trace of any, any momentum tensor that has dimension three over five in okay. this one. And, but, yeah. and one more. So you said that you can generalize this SC3 to some higher rank yes. algebra and then... So in general, the SC3 could be any, any simple... The well, level is always two. Uh, no, no, the level can be anything as well. So you can have level K, so the two can be any integer. And the SU3 can be any simply laced algebra. Then you mod up by U1 to the rank only? Uh, for these models, yes. So these homogeneous sign Gordons, they are specifically defined like this. So the, the U1 is to the rank. So you have uh, 
yeah, the cartons of algebra there. Uh, there is another family. So when, uh, when Miramontes and collaborators worked on this, what they discovered in their work in the 90s is that there were two families of perturbations of Bessemer and Witten that you could uh, construct. One family they called these homogeneous sine Gordon models, and the other family is the symmetric space sine Gordon models, which I also worked on uh, um, in my PhD. And these symmetric space sine Gordon models, uh, they are associated to more general cosets, so you can have more general things. But unfortunately, their scattering matrix has not been constructed yet. Um, actually, I, we, we tried for a while and we never really succeeded. So this is an open problem as far as I know. But uh, for those, there is a more generic set of cosets you can look at, more complicated things. Yeah, yeah. thank you.